Welcome to Teaching That Counts, a podcast dedicated to the teaching and learning of mathematics. We discuss a variety of topics from building thinking classrooms to creating a more equitable math class. I hope that the conversations that I have with my guests help inspire you in your own classroom, school, or district, or if you're a parent like me, with your child's mathematics journey. You can find me via my website, teachingthatcountspodcast.com, or on socials at Maestas Teach. Thank you again for joining me, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, welcome to the Teaching That Counts podcast. Um, so glad to be with you in this episode. So I'm just coming off a wonderful trip to the NCTM Regional Conference in Seattle, and I got the opportunity to moderate the opening sessions keynote panel. What a wonderful way to open the session. We talked about student belonging and the experiences that really we can use to foster student belonging in our math class. I'll have another podcast that's wrapping up NCTM's regional conference in Seattle. I'll talk a few more. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'm hoping as the podcast goes on that I'll be able to speak to each of the panelists and we'll in the podcast individually and talk about some of those things. So what a great time. Stay tuned. One of the an episode coming up will talk about that. In this episode, well, you're going to hear interviews with two two of our math coaches here in our district. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that we've been doing a lot of things around building thinking classrooms. Last season, our whole season was devoted to building thinking classrooms. And, and we did a book study where we used the practices. And we heard from teachers and admin about you know what they see in those practices, how the students are doing, what uh, what things were needed to work on, work on, uh, what things were going well, what things could change. So as we went through that study, I had an opportunity to go to the Building Thinking Classrooms conference to touch base and be part of the the Facebook group, and something came up not too long ago about using manipulatives in a thinking classroom. Our math coaches have been working with elementary school teachers using the building thinking classroom practices. And so I asked them, how do they go about using some real important manipulatives with elementary students and using vertical non-permanent surfaces? So we talk algebra tiles, uh, base 10 blocks, and how teachers have been using those in the space that they're provided. So hopefully this discussion is helpful for those out there that are looking at implementing building thinking classrooms and how you can use manipulatives to enhance your students' work in their teams at their vertical non-permanent surfaces. So I hope you enjoy these interviews that I had recently. All right, (laughs) well, we're here talking about um, building thinking classrooms, and specifically there was, so there was a, a, a and I'm here with Sarah and Mel, Hi. the complete team Hello. of our math team, and so there was a, a, a message on the Facebook board the other day about manipulatives and building thinking classrooms, and I really think that the question stems from the use of vertical non-permanent surfaces and still wanting to be able to use manipulatives. So I asked the two of you to come and talk with you because I know that you've been doing a lot of things in the elementary grades with um, building thinking classrooms and the vertical non-permanent surfaces, as well as I know we've been doing stuff in junior high with non-permanent vertical non-permanent surfaces. So I thought we'd have a, a conversation around using manipulatives because I know that you've been doing that. Mm-hmm. So um, what have you been doing and what's worked well with, at least in the elementary level, what's worked really well when using manipulatives and vertical non-permanent surfaces? One thing that I've been doing this in a couple of classes, um, the range from second to fourth grade. In the fourth grade class, what we did was we had a station. So they had their vertical non-permanent surface and then near their um, whiteboard surface, 
they had a desk that had the manipulatives on it. So they started standing at the desk. We still did randomized groups, and we always have them standing to do this. So they stand, they stood at their tables, and they were using the manipulatives to kind of build what they did. And then they went to the whiteboard to transfer their thinking. Like, how does that transfer into a written method? Or how does that transfer into an expression or equation and connecting that work? The one thing that we found when we were sharing out was the students do have to go from one desk to the other. So it is logistical and like, I have to go from here to here. Some um, teachers have talked about moving a desk and putting it underneath or near the surface rather than having it kind of away, but having it in that one area so that they can still utilize those manipulatives <clears throat> and connect it to what's happening um, up on the non-permanent surfaces that they're working on. The thing about manipulatives, though, it's still a non-permanent surface, but it's just at that time, I mean, unless they're magnetic, they, they can still move things around. They're still processing their thinking as they're going, and, and they are showing that they can make the connections to written methods or drawings as they're working. So that was more of a fourth grade example. With second grade, the manip manipulatives, if they are the focus, usually they are within the lesson. I've just had them standing and um, working at their tables and writing there. And even though that's not vertical, yeah, yeah. it's still their vertical. And we find that that has increased the engagement, but their their written method is usually kind of attached to that, just kind of um, in some cases where we were, it was just to, to keep the kids in one area and on task. So they had, they were, so they were kind of like huddled around mm -hmm. a desk or a couple of desks using the manipulate. What manipulatives were? Base they, 10 blocks. Or base 10 blocks. Cubes. Second yeah. grade. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they were using the manipulatives and then were they writing at that table? Mm -hmm. Okay. Writing at, right at the table. At the table. On their desk. So it's like a, not a vertical, it's a standing horizontal. horizontal. Yes. Yeah. But when the students shared out, they were able to huddle around the table and talk about it and um, we've tried this standing and sitting, and we find that the act of the student standing actually made the difference. Mm. So, um, and not, we haven't in this class tried moving to the wall. We just felt at this age group, it was more appropriate to keep them at their desk because they were focused and it was, um, they were doing the thinking. They were talking about the math and they were making the connections. Cool. You got something? <laughs> um, I, I agree with Mel. I think that if you are going to have manipulatives and you want them on a vertical non-permanent surface, the closer they can be to that vertical mm -hmm. non-permanent surface, I think the easier it is for the students to transfer. Um, I've done a few in um, second grade is where I've lived a little bit with this and um, having them standing at a desk. Um, is great and using manipulatives and even doing a gallery walk they'll walk and see each other's work um, but we have found if they are going to transfer it to a vertical non-permanent surface it's nice if there's a desk right underneath that yeah. where they can um, see their work and be able to transfer it to a model or drawing or diagram yeah and, and I think that some people out some some people out there they they read building theme classrooms and they're oh everyone's got to be standing up and all of a sudden there's no technology there's no manipulatives there's no hands-on it's just writing on the board and and i like the idea of it being up and vertical but all those kinesthetic things that we know work with kids still should be worked with kids mm -hmm. um they help reduce the thinking that's a tool that they're using. I mean, if we're building a thinking classroom, it's the tool to produce the thinking. It might not follow into this great recipe that we have here. Might have to be tweaked sometimes to yeah. allow for the thinking to happen. Yeah, yeah, that tweaking. I was so I was having a conversation with. Um, actually, let me step back a second. So, I was in a geometry class. So I was in a geometry. We teach math too here, but I was doing a geometry lesson, and we were using patty paper, and I. You remember patty paper? I love patty paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> My kids ask me, why do they call it patty paper? So, do they well, go to you gross when you tell them? Well, I tried <laughs> to tell them and they were like, okay. Um, anyway, we were doing it because we were doing transformations um, with parallel lines and proving that the, the angles were congruent. And I had a hard time thinking about how to get that type of manipulative, that patty paper with the transparent piece vertical mm -hmm. what are your what was i i still haven't saw i mean 
I really worked it the same way you did with uh, with high school students. I had them standing, but in groups, and had them doing the patty paper there. But I would have liked to have their thinking up on the board. Um, I'm wondering if it's a. I don't know. I'm not sure how much of the the thinking's involved in what's happening with that manipulative at the time, but taking pictures and putting them in slides and having those represented or. I mean, we've taped things up, but that's not manipulative. It's, it's what they're using. I think it's more about, I think for me, sometimes it's more about the connection and the method. Like if mm. I'm holding it and seeing it, how am I making that connection? Or if I'm looking at it and seeing it, how am I making the connection to it? And that maybe can be what I put vertical. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's where I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm working in it. I'm getting kind of messy with the math. But then how can I take the connections that I've made the, and, and then the math that I'm seeing and put that more in a, a vertical place and talk about that and then just have my manipulative as a reference. I see I it know. as patty paper. You can't really, if you have a group of three, you can't really do it all together. So I see that more as each student has their own patty paper mm -hmm. and working together. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the transfer is what's similar or what's mm -hmm. different or um, because they all might have different work or they've worked their patty paper a little bit differently that could be the transfer of now maybe how we go from 3D to 2D, mm. something like that. Yeah, and I've always, I've kind of struggled also with these vertical, with using vertical non-permanent surfaces and thinking about how to get um, pictures up there. So with the example of the, the transformations, right? We want to take a figure and transform it to another, you know, doing a couple of transformations how do I get that on? Like, I guess they can recreate the drawing, but sometimes it's nice to have the drawing so that they can manipulate the transparency or the paper mm -hmm. before. Um, so what are your thoughts about getting maybe pictures up on the wall? Have you done that in, in mm -hmm. elementary I've done schools? it, yeah, in elementary because they were adding and subtracting using a number line. And sometimes, um, this was second grade again, having them draw the number line Sometimes the number line's given for them, and so I have cut out the number line and I've taped it up mm -hmm. on their surface or non-vertical. Vertical number and surface. Yes, exactly <laughs> that. Um, I've taped it up, and when they're working on the jumps, they're doing the jumps where they can erase and you know redo it. But the number line's taped up there for them mm. because um, sometimes it's given for them and they don't have to draw it. So I've done that. One thing I think too that really helps is that. Um, on the back side of the white books is that gridded side yeah, yeah. where they can draw yeah. the number lines, mm -hmm. open number lines, and they can use and do their tick marks and things like that. So that has helped in making them utilize that space to show their thinking in that time. I'm just wondering if they can just use the patty paper to kind of manipulate what they've created on the board. Sometimes. Yeah, as we're talking, I'm thinking, you know, we used to, well, we still do sometimes the call them whiteboards, but they were pretty much just the paper, what are those things called where you put the sleep paper? Protectors. The sleeves, yeah, sleep protectors. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder you cut those out, or I wonder if they still make those old school transparency papers. Do you remember? I yeah, remember working. Yep. And you can use that as your mm -hmm. patty paper if you put it up on the vertical non permanent surface and then you're just moving things this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. That would work. Well, well, we've also well, talked a lot about kindergarten <laughs> and what oh, that yeah. might look like. So I don't, we haven't dabbled yet too much in kindergarten, but we've talked about what it might look like. Um, once we have our release days, I think we'll have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. But we've talked about ordering the smaller non-permanent uh -huh. surfaces. Vertical surfaces. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't be vertical. With kinder, maybe having um, a pair because they really work in, they work well in pairs before they get to groups of three. And having the students work together in a pair on a smaller surface um, and then eventually transferring that to the wall, depending on what they're doing and if they have manipulatives. They have uh, manipulatives a lot of the time. Yep. So. Yeah, I imagine they could put blocks down and, and trace things mm -hmm. on top of that mm -hmm. board. Um, well, I'd be interested in hearing what you come up with for kinder. I know my wife is, she's been uh, in two kinder classes doing her student teaching, and so... Um, she came along with us to the B the Building Thinking Classroom conference last year, and um, I haven't asked her about doing it in kinder, so 
you guys would be the experts that I'd go to. We'll, we'll have more information, <laughs> more information after mid-March. Yeah, because <laughs> we'll be in all kinder first and second classrooms. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what, what we come up with. We used to have them on the floor a lot, and then we found the power of standing up. So being yeah. able to even organize your room if they're not vertical, they're horizontal, but the students are standing up and manipulating um, the mat. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, at 5'10", it's way easier if they're standing on a desk than sitting on the floor. At what? <laughs> I mean, like, lean up at five, being tall. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. hard yeah. to, when they're on the floor versus sitting oh, on a yeah, desk, yeah. it's way more efficient. And being able to see kind of where everything is. So there's some structures in place. We just usually put them around the room, and they can still do gallery walks. They still kind of walk in a counterclockwise circle. What do you notice? Go back and talk about it. So all those things are kind of still embedded within it, and, but it's just the visual is just a little bit flat. <laughs> flatter, flatter. No, flatter. <laughs> so here's a, a question. I, I know I'm gonna get a, um, I'm gonna get some good answers from Mel here. Watch. Um, Sweet, I'm off the hook. Or Mike and Sarah have a good answer. <laughs> Digital manipulatives versus real life mm-hmm. manipulatives. Um, I guess not only how they relate to the building thinking classroom, but what, what are some pros and cons of going either way? Um, and having a conversation with Jamie Garner in the county like five or six years ago, she said that the research that she did on it was that there wasn't anything extremely um, different in using one versus the other. The thing with a manipulative, though, is can they actually manipulate it? So if it's a digital manipulative, can I actually break a power a base 10 block? Or is it just there and I'm moving them and I'm adding them and grouping them? But can I break out, break apart a 10 and have 10 ones and move that around? Because that's the... I think that's the process that helps students make that connection to what's happening when they're doing that. Um, some students work better with the actual physical manipulatives. Some students actually work better with the digital manipulatives. I just think it has to be, is it a manipulative or just a substitute for a diagram? Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. So that's where you have to look. Am I actually able to manipulate and build something if I'm using the virtual one or am I just creating a representation? that looks like a picture and not able to break apart, move things around, things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. I like. Hopefully it makes sense to people out there. <laughs> I like the blocks. Sometimes children like to taste test them and things like that. So it might be a thing. Um, oh, like, uh, like Joe Bowler's sugar cube mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they lick, lick the sugar cube. Um, yeah. But I think Sick. there is value in having them actually physically like connect the connecting cubes together and making a 10 and putting it here and then connecting 10 more and putting them here mm. and making that connection to what they're that touch to what they're doing so if they can touch and do it in the virtual setting i think that's that's a good substitute what do you think i think mel's right the reality is is sometimes um virtual is a little bit better because they're just not there yet with having hands-on manipulatives um, I think, same as Mel, hands-on is better kinesthetically, that they're actually putting it together, breaking it apart. Um, however, reality of what's going on in a classroom, sometimes um, teachers need to use virtual manipulatives. I think just keeping in mind, um, obviously uh, students can't really share a computer, mm-hmm. um, so how would the teacher be monitoring what the students are doing? So that's yeah. going to look a little bit different if I'm in a pair or I'm in a trio and we're working together and we're using um, actual manipulatives. It's going to and a teacher's walking around. That's going to look very different than every student at their computer. Um, so how is a student? Or just keeping in mind, how's the teacher going to monitor what's going on um, and what the students are doing and how the students are interacting with it and how are they thinking through it? I know that. Um, the teachers that have the ViewSonics, it's nice for the students to come up and they can manipulate whole class um, to model what they're doing. I'm also a huge fan of the magnetic ones where mm-hmm. students can come up and manipulate them in front of the class. So I think it's what works best for the teacher and the students at the time. And it's nice to have a variety. So sometimes virtual might work better and sometimes hands-on might work better. I don't think that has to be a whole class blanket thing, too. If the majority of your class can use the physical manipulatives and you have a couple students who just work better mm-hmm. with the virtual for maybe management reasons, I think it's okay to have them there and have the other students working with 
the actual ones. I really think especially K2, they really need to start making those connections, especially as they go from counters to number cube, not number cubes, what are those things called? Connecting, Connecting cubes. cubes to the base 10 system. So. Mm -hmm. um, you've had experience being in classes with both of them. Which one do you think has the higher engagement? I mean, does it depend on also the grade Effective and class and engagement? stuff? <laughs> I don't know. I think students like things mixed up sometimes, honestly. I, I think they like using the manipulatives in class, but I've also gone into like fourth grade classes working in fractions where it just, it worked better to use the virtual manipulatives for fraction tiles and build them because at the same time we could connect it in that to a number line. And then I didn't have to use the time spending showing them how to draw the number line to be at scale with the thing, with the... Fraction, fraction tiles. tiles. Thank you. Thank you for filling in all the links today <laughs> with the fraction tiles because the program that we were using was able to do that directly for them. So they were able yeah. to build it and then we dragged the number line up to it and they made that connection. Then they could see how they could then connect those tape diagrams to or connect the fraction tiles, the tape diagram from the tape diagrams to the number line. So it helped make that progression. I think sometimes it's just what, what is it that you're wanting them to produce with it. Mm. So. There's also some standards that are in the lower grades where they can use concrete models. So we need to have an awareness of those proficiency skills that says they can do it with concrete models and they would be proficient at a three. So if, if they don't have to use a written method, so keeping in mind mm -hmm. your standards as well, um, what standards require a written method and what standards um, students can still use manipulatives to be able to add and subtract. And always having them handy for students to, or accessible for mm -hmm. students to have them. I think, Thank you for that, because I, you know, I see from COVID that we went, like, a lot of teachers went right into digital everything, mm -hmm. and then it was hard to get away from digital everything. Um, one thing I loved about Building Thinking Classrooms is it went, it, it almost felt to me like it was going back to being a little bit old school. Like, let's get out of being in front of a computer the whole time, and let's get into some groups, let's write some things down, let's... Let's um, let's start seeing math instead of, you know, trying to do everything on the computer, which was which has been nice um, in the at the high school level. I have I think one thing that we've got away gotten away from over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so is the use of algebra tiles. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see us go back to using algebra tiles and manipulate it to the high school level. I don't know how, how much you've seen teachers use manipulatives in high school, but other than the patty paper thing, I don't see it very often. <laughs> I see I see um, Desmos being used as the, I think, the supplement or the replacement. And I love Desmos. In fact, I, I had a conversation with a teacher with Grant about using Desmos and technology in a building thinking classroom. But I kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Like how can we get, how can we just get teachers to think that you know it's okay to use manipulatives in high school? Um, I was I was with a, a teacher the other day. She now it's just eighth grade, but she had all of the blocks and all of the tiles and everything there because she was teaching solving equations. Mm -hmm. And the students were 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 struggling. These are eighth graders. They were really struggling with solving equations coming through their previous experience. And, and as I was going through this lesson with them, man, these kids were doing great because she had really built that kinesthetic understanding of what was happening with equations with those algebra tiles. So, so I really think it's lost. I really think it should be brought back a whole bunch. Um, but I just want to get your thoughts on like, how do we get that back into the class? I know I work with them a lot. I just don't know what, what I could be doing. I think that <clears throat> solving equations is extremely abstract for a lot of students. And when we're in the classrooms and you know we talk about combining like terms and we have a 5x and a 3x, they really have no understanding of what that means and the struggle with combining like terms and why are they like terms, I feel like it's really foreign. And it's important to bring in those algebra tiles, even if the teacher has a magnetic set and is working through those types of problems up on a whiteboard for students to just visually see 
how they are like terms and what that means when you have positives and negatives and you're solving for X. And, you know, I understand maybe not having manipulatives out for every single student, but they those come digital. So, and the curriculum really talks about balancing and they use hangers and they use squares and triangles when we talk about balancing equations. Um, but you need that middle ground of taking that concept of balancing equations to algebra tiles to then actually that abstract. And I agree that's the missing link. Um, and they really don't understand um, what that means, what 5X means or looks like. So even if it's just starting with the teacher, having magnetic algebra tiles or putting students on and using the virtual ones is gonna help make the connection of why we combine like terms and how we solve for X. Well, there's a ton of research, adolescent research on the adolescent brain, right? That that kids, out abstract things like algebra, like 5X plus 3X is harder for them to, to get than if it's tied to a context or it's tied to something mm -hmm. kinesthetic. And I think we, we put the cart before the horse a lot of times. We're like, oh, well, 5X plus 3X, I can hammer that down and that's going to be the easy thing before I teach them how to do the context. Mm -hmm. But really, it should be the other way around. Like, how can we get the context and the kinesthetic before we make the algebraic, um, the, the, the algebraic, uh, what word am I going for? Algorithm, <laughs> algebraic algorithm, I guess you could say, right? <laughs> procedure. Yeah, procedure yeah. down. I think I agree with both what you're saying. I think that goes back to the, the math teaching practice, having students have a conceptual understanding of what's happening before we expect procedural fluency from them. And I think sometimes we go straight to that procedural fluency because we want that to be the end game. I'm thinking about the parallels between what's happening with second graders in terms of adding and subtracting with a, in 100 to being able to solve you know, linear equations or even linear systems is they don't understand what's happening until you make a connection from that concrete to being to them having a strategy to a written method and then them connecting that concrete to being able to then draw a diagram we can think about how students can do that in terms of what conceptual understanding are you getting from using that manipulative and how can you make that into a diagram what are you doing and how can you make that into a written method okay so how does that written method that you're using connect to the strategy that you're using so they're, they're they have a strategy it's embedded within that written method but then how can I connect that to the written method for them and make that connection? It's like, you already see it instead of me telling it to you. So using the manipulative strategically, like we do in elementary school, is like, here's the concrete. How do I connect it to that written method? How do I connect that written method to the abstract or the procedure that you're doing? And I think that's where, I think work can be done in all grade levels in, in terms of helping support that concrete understanding. I think sometimes it gets done too quickly and we have to think about that's that's a, over the time, but I think because of how our units are structured, we think like, okay, it has to be done right now. Mm -hmm. But it can be done within this time frame, and then they continue to work and use what they need as needed. Because if they're still having to use concrete, that's where they are. How can I get them from concrete to understanding what they're writing? Yeah. The other thing that kind of resonated with me, which we've talked a lot about, was starting with context. Um, especially when we're like working with fractions. What is 5x and what is 3x mm -hmm. and who cares? Yep. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> but even context when we think about fractions or context when we think about adding and subtracting um, integers, positive and negatives, like there's a lot of shortcuts. We see a lot of shortcuts in the classroom and students, you know, are really, some of them memorize those sort shortcuts and some of them don't. And then when we get to word problems, then we see that students are really struggling because now they have, they don't know what shortcut to use. So really when we're thinking about, especially adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing fractions, having a really solid foundation of, and or understanding of fractions and really using context. Um, a lot of students can figure it out when you add context, but then before we move into the abstract, and same with integers in seventh grade, really having them work a lot with context, with adding and subtracting integers or multiplying and dividing integers before we take that away and teach them the shortcut. Yeah. Yeah, I think the best way to remember 
or to understand integers is to tie it to a real life context first. I, I, it reminds me of the scene in Stand and Deliver when he's like, when he's digging the hole. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. That's my favorite. Favorite teacher movie is, is, uh, is Stand and Deliver, but he's, he's telling the, the, the student, you know, you dig a hole, that's negative. Fill the hole, you zero, like negative, positive. So just tying it to some sort of understanding of why. Like, why are we doing this? What, like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when they get in older grades and they have context or a table or a graph and they have to then write an equation and then solve the equation. So seeing all those connections to something and why they're doing what they're doing, I think helps and algebra tiles will help with that. I think that's something too, it takes time, but I think if you do less, if you look at less problems, that just sounds funny in my head, so I didn't say that loud. <laughs> but if you're looking at doing less problems with them, but going deeper with that understanding of the connections, I think that's going to help support um, them making an understanding of what's happening rather than just having to repeat, 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 repeat in number of over problems. Quantity. Yes. Yeah, and we use use the algebra tiles, use the context, and let the students struggle and productive struggle, and then come up with their own shortcuts, their own ideas, written method. the written methods, and then the teacher solidifies those and shows them the algebraic pieces. Mm -hmm. And then they can decide, well, I'm going to use the algebraic piece or I'm going to, I'm going to still use the, the model, mm -hmm. the area model to find, to factor a trinomial, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the goal is we don't want them to stay with the manipulatives forever, but we want to give them opportunities to see the connection to the written method, to be able to then just use that method to support their work moving forward with context. Yeah. That's a great ending. That's exa exactly what we want students to do with manipulatives. So, well, thanks for joining me um, today. And I appreciate the conversation. Um, I appreciate all the stuff that you guys helped me with too, thinking about how I could use manipulatives in the high school and how we can get that back. I'd love to see them. Mm -hmm. Love to see them more. Come join us for kinder. <laughs> we have lots of days. It'll be great. It'll be great. Uh, it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining. We'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks. <laughs>